Welcome. I'm here with Travis Good. He is the editor of His Talk Connect, and he is also co-founder of uh, Catalyze.io, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit about all of those things. But I was attracted to Travis's ideas on uh, on the blog, on His Talk Connect, and he has a lot of uh, foresight thinking and ideas about the future of medicine. So welcome, Travis. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You've done so many different types of things. You've got a very interesting background. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to uh, sort of briefly go through it. So um, my background originally, uh, I went to school and went to college um, for information systems, computer science. That's what my first bachelor's and master's degree were in. I spent about four years in the technology sector uh, working for some large consulting companies. And actually at that point, um, before I was really in healthcare, I ended up I, I was working on healthcare engagements with. Um, it was early stage people looking at um, hardening systems for things like HIPAA. Uh, during that time, decided I wanted to go back to school. I went back to medical school, thinking I'd step away from technology, um, and thinking I'd you know focus exclusively on, on clinical medicine. And actually, at the time, really wanted to be a, a rural a general surgeon. Um, and which is funny now just because of how far I've come from that. But in medical school, sort of got pulled back into technology. I decided um, while I was in school to, to get my MBA focused in healthcare and started doing consulting work um, uh, while I was still in school for some uh, local as well as some national health care organizations doing everything from iPad rollouts to diabetes apps and SMS campaigns for patients. Um, I decided ultimately during my final year of, of medical school to to not pursue a clinical residency and to focus exclusively on, on health technology. Um, also in school, I started writing and editing the, the His Talk um, Connect site, or at the time it was called His Talk Mobile. We sort of broadened that that the, the the spectrum of the news that we cover to include not just mobile health technologies, but really what we say connected. So that's you know telehealth, and we also cover a lot of startups um, in healthcare. I uh, have done consulting work for healthcare companies since 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 medical school. Um, healthcare companies, uh, platform companies, mobile platform companies, um, startups, and doing price transparency and, and you sort of name it, um, all across the board. And most recently, um, I was working on a. I, I started a company called ShareMD last summer. We were initially focused around physician collaboration. Um, targeting academic medicine, residency programs, medical schools, uh, and sort of expanded beyond that to physician profiles. Um, and that, that is still something that we are, we are working on and, and working with several partners, which is pretty exciting. But most recently um, launched a company uh, called Catalyze.io, and that really grew out of my own experience um, in building ShareMD and building uh, secure and interoperable uh, apps for, for healthcare. Discovering that you know there's a, there's a need for services, infra, technology infrastructure services to help developers, help enterprises, help development shops very quickly um, and inexpensively um, build and test health, uh, applications for health and wellness, and applications that at least from a technology security standpoint meet um, HIPAA requirements and uh, support interoperable, interoperable and, and, and emerging exchange standards for data like CCDA um, coming on, on board soon, blue button, things like that. Um, and so that is me in a nutshell, a lot of different things. Um, and I have a, just a, it's an industry that I love and um, I'm very, very passionate about. And, you know, I'm excited to talk to you about it. I can, your, your ideas are very exciting and passionate. Um, and I think there's a huge need for what you're developing with, with Catalyze at IO because uh, I know so many people say, oh, I have this great idea for an app uh, or a health app, but they're intimidated by that whole process. You know, they're intimidated by uh, the HIPAA restrictions or, or different security issues. And so uh, I think that that's really an interesting area to follow. So we'll have to chat more about that as well. <laughs> okay, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, a lot of that grew out of my own experience. I, I have physicians, providers, and developers contact me all the time just because of the, the blog, because of... Um, his talk with ideas, and, and I, I, I constantly hear that you know they they were intimidated by things like HIPAA security and, and working with you know existing systems and data things like that. Fantastic. So, if you could put out your crystal ball um, to summarize some of the ideas uh, that you see for the future of medicine in, in the next ten years, what are you seeing? <laughs> um, 
Well, so there's a few sort of really high level trends that, that we're seeing that I think will continue. I mean, um, you know, the big ones are things like uh, paying for quality and not quantity. So things like, you know, uh, accountable care organizations paying to deliver um, or, or keep people healthy, essentially, as opposed to, you know, treating them and, and performing procedures and getting them into the office, actually being rewarded um, for taking care of them, keeping that, them out of the office. Uh, along with that comes a lot of the, the, the trends around patient engagement and, and more broadly, I think, patient ownership uh, of their health records. Um, and of you know, or at least participation and decision making around healthcare, or, or decision making for, for for healthcare for themselves, personal healthcare. Um, and so those are those are pretty major major shifts, you know, sort of just at a, at a system level. Um, some of the other things we're seeing are, you know, there, there's a huge push to um, to have some degree of uh, price transparency and cost transparency in healthcare, and it's a, it's a challenging. Um, industry to do it in because there's so many layers. The trend, it's not a very clean transaction. There's just a lot of people between uh, the buyer and the seller, if you will. Um, and so because of that, it is, it, it's a, it, it's a hard thing to do. And in, in many ways, the, the, the buyer, the consumer, the patient is pretty insulated from the transaction. So um, I think there's huge trends and you see companies like Castlight Health um, and simply and other people like that moving down that road. And also with cost, there's a, there's a pretty huge push in medicine. Um, it, or there's a, there's certainly, it's starting to, to get momentum to start training physicians to start at least thinking about costs or understanding cost um, as it relates to care. Um, that's another, that's another huge, huge area and it's totally separate from the patient side of cost, but it's something that is sorely lacking in medical education and that's both undergraduate and graduate medical education. But there's people like Chris Moriarty's at, at UCSF and Vinny Aurora at University of Chicago that are doing great things around educating physicians, uh, related to cost of care. I think some of the other, um, trends we're seeing are, are related to healthcare, or sorry, techno healthcare technology and, you see, you know, everybody's talking about big data. Um, and most recently, I started talking about little data, which is basically what I see is, I, 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 it's not my term, I read it somewhere, but it's basically big data on an individual. So we have all these apps. Um, we have uh, sensor technology. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a, a fuel band, um, but you've got, you know, Fitbit and Withing Scales and, you know, blood pressure cuffs that are connected. And then you have apps where people can record their moods and, um, you know, connected glucometers, whatever it might be, um, we're collecting tons and tons of data on people, um, and it's just going to sort of increase um, in time. Uh, the question then becomes, how do we actually use that data to provide sort of meaningful, actionable advice to patients and ideally drive some um, uh, drive some positive decision-making when it comes to lifestyle decisions? And so I think that is going to be an incredibly huge trend in healthcare um, and, not, and beyond healthcare. I mean, that's, that's, I almost see that as like a societal trend because we're, we're societally, we're very unhealthy and it doesn't all relate to the way that physicians provide care. Um, but I think the physicians are going to, or at least the health system is going to play a role um, in interpreting and, and helping patients interpret and, uh, and make use of all this data that they're collecting about themselves, either passively or, or actively. So, uh, I'm sure there's some other trends that I'm missing, uh, um, but those are really the big ones. And there's things that fall out from under the, from, from each of those, um, but there, there's there's a lot of things happening in healthcare, and there's a lot of really interesting companies and, and uh, that are getting funded and testing products. And I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see what happens um, as we move forward, as the doctor-patient relationship changes a bit, um, as as Again, I think we'll probably talk a little about concierge medicine. We start to see, uh, which is another another trend in, in most recent data, is that 10% of physicians are going to have some aspect of concierge medicine in their practices in the next couple of years. Um, and really, I think concierge or direct primary care, whatever you look at it, or whatever you want to call it, um, is an attempt to, to cut out some of those middlemen and, and really connect patients back to, to providers um, and deliver care, and by cutting out some of those middlemen, ideally reducing the cost, enabling providers to spend more time with patients, provide better service to patients. Um, so I think that's another, uh, also a pretty big trend, but at the same time, you know, that's 10%, but we also have the trend to physicians becoming employed physicians, um, which, depending on how you look at it, may be cyclical, but, um, you know, that, that, that's another big trend, but I think the, the one that's, at least from my perspective, more exciting is the trend towards concierge. 
Yes, yeah, so you had cited that statistic of like ten percent, I believe, would convert in the next one to three years. And what I'm seeing a little bit more, it's 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 not just that elitist concierge model, but more of a trend towards a subscription model. And uh, mm-hmm. with companies like One Medical just getting uh, huge funding from Google, um, and you know, a, there's a lot of similarities there in terms of. Uh, longer uh, interactions with patients with longer appointments, same day appointments, um, and also you know using these technologies like you were talking about, uh, having this constant da- data and also having it um, kind of like mini checks where you can check in a lot more often yep. from a wellness perspective on on uh, what is happening. So it more preventative, and I and I I just I see that as as a huge. Uh, trend. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, no, definitely. So, um, one medical, uh, so, so concierge, you know, uh, I, I don't know what the official history of concierge medicine is, but, um, at least my interpretation of the history of concierge medicine is, uh, you know, initially concierge medicine was about, um, physicians limiting their practice and, and setting up, um, Basically, uh, taking their their uh, patient population, their patient panel of several thousand patients, and trimming it down to several hundred, five, six hundred, and charging a pretty high amount to become a member of somebody's practice. Um, and the idea being that you know through membership, patients again, like the things you were saying, get to spend more time with their pa- with, with their providers. Their providers get to spend more time both with and on their patients' cases. So, understanding what their problems are, researching what solutions might work for them. Um, and uh, but but more recently, and I, I think on the West Coast, companies like Medlion and Q Lions, and I, I would really even call One Medical, you know, direct primary care, where it's a much less expensive option as opposed to sort of the original concierge model, which was you know fifteen hundred up to three thousand dollars a year for somebody to become a member of one of these exclusive practices. Um, what what we're seeing is people can spend you know. I don't know. I think the numbers are anywhere from $99 a year on up to a few hundred dollars a year to become members of these direct primary care practices. Um, and I think that direct primary care holds, I, or concierge, whatever you want to call it, it, it really holds a lot of promise because I think, you know, it's great for both sides of the, both sides of the equation. You have patients that, that, you know, really crave that additional time with physicians. Um, they crave the convenience, you know, the ability to schedule same day appointments, to schedule online. Um, to email their physicians. I mean, you look at Kaiser's uh, health manager, PHR, and how people use it. A big thing that they want to do is be able to email their physicians. So I think, you know, direct primary care, I think all the practices I've seen offer that. Um, And then from a physician perspective, I mean, you know, um, lots of physicians. And, I mean, my my wife is a physician as well, and I I talk to tons of doctors. I mean, they really go into medicine, the the vast majority go into medicine to, to care for patients, right? And there is... There is really something to that doctor-patient relationship. Um, it's just it, 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 we put so many things in between it that it's become tarnished, um, and we've sort of eroded the time that you can spend on it by requiring all this additional time for you know documenting and coding and all these other things that doctors aren't paid for. Um, so you know, I think from a physician perspective, it's incredibly appealing because it gets you back to focusing on patients and having more time to focus on patients and really get to know your patients, get to know what their problems are and figure out how to fix those problems and, and, and work collaboratively with the patient to fix those problems. So, um, I mean, as a model, I think it's, I think it's very exciting to see it. And I think that hopefully one medical is kind of the poster child, um, because they just raised, you know, I think they're like $77 million they've raised, which, is great. It's also concerning because it, it shows that they need money. They need a lot of money to scale something like One Medical. But we're seeing them start to open offices. Most recently, I'm I'm, out, I'm near Chicago, and most recently they opened. They're they're opening a practice in Chicago, um, and so it will be great to see if One Medical can successfully scale this into different markets and start you know uh, promoting and, and increasing awareness amongst patients as well. Um, and then ideally, we'll see some other practices that aren't just like One Medical. Um, in my ideal world, we actually start to see, um, ways where physicians, existing physicians can start offering concierge like services, um, enabled by technology. So, um, maybe not requiring, um, sort of one medical kind of, they have a whole model where they come in, they change their office. They do a lot of things. Um, 
it's, it's a large change for a practice, but I think it will be great to see um, technology enable physicians to almost start doing virtual concierge services or adding in some using technology to create some of that connectivity. And I think, I think we are going to, we're, we're, I think a lot of patients are willing to pay for that connectivity and that convenience, even if it's somewhat virtual. Um, but virtual in the sense of not contacting somebody from like a big telehealth network like Health Nation or American Well, uh, but connected through virtually to their to their to their PCP or their um, their main provider, at least their main provider group. I think that would be hugely valuable and, and really really exciting to scale um, some form of concierge and. and as something that, again, physicians would like and, um, you know, something where it's direct pay service from patients and patients would like it even if they pay a little bit more than their um, their copay because they have more convenient and direct access to their physician. So um, I think concierge is a, I mean, I think concierge is a great model. And I, I honestly, I'd love to see more of it because I think that it's something that's intriguing to physicians and especially young physicians who right now um, are graduating from uh, residency programs and you know, very intimidated by going into private practice, very intimidated. So, so many of them are taking employed positions, uh, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that if there were more options for them, and I think concierge may open up more options for them. Um, uh, we, we'd even see more people going into concierge, more physicians going into concierge or, or direct primary care. Yes, I think so, too, because, I mean, people are looking for more meaning in their lives uh, in, in, yeah. in their careers. And the doctors have been hard pressed with the demands on their time for a long time now. So, um, yes. and it's interesting too what you were talking about because I think that the data and the health information that we're going to see from these new qualitative relationships, I think, is going to be really fascinating because I think you'll have a lot more advances in health uh, with people talking to each other, don't you think? <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, and so what types of technologies are uh, are you seeing uh, with your crystal ball uh, that you think will help uh, concierge medicine or this more patient-centered type of care? Uh, what kind of health IT, what kind of apps, what are you seeing as being useful in this transition? Well, so I think, you know, I mean, I... I I think you could. I mean, I think you could look at One Medical and some of the services that they offer virtually to get a pretty good sense of what would uh, what would be the types of applications and technologies that a concierge practice or even a virtual concierge practice might want. Um, but I think that what you're seeing is, you know, there, there's there's obvious. I mean, if you look at things like some of the basic services like scheduling, for example, um, you know, you have ZocDoc and a few other companies, which are ZocDoc being the best known, but a few other companies that are, that are going after that where it's somewhere somebody can just go and book an appointment. Now, ZocDoc is built to book an appointment with any physician, not just your own physician. So it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily concierge, but I think, you know, apps to, to schedule appointments or, or even websites. And I think increasingly mobile, at least it doesn't have to be apps, but mobile enabled websites, uh, for scheduling. I think the other big one that I mentioned also, um, was uh, was um, communicating or messaging your physician, whether that looks like an email and is an email, is a secure email, or is an in-app message, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, that ability to send messages to your physician and get responses from them, um, I think, is going to be a huge part of that practice. And, and you know, the, the, I, there is, obviously, I don't think you can cut out in person. Um, I don't think you can cut out in person from a lot of relationships, but especially doctor-patient uh, we, we can't we can't remove that in person interactivity between doctor and and, um, and patient, but I think that you can leverage technology to um, to sort of make that relationship more ongoing, more continuous. You know, if you're using sort of the, the healthcare terms, providing more continuous care and connectivity as opposed to episodic care and connectivity, which has been the, the historical um, construct we've used. And so I think, you know, that just that connectivity and ability to message. I think with messaging, what we're starting to see, and there's a couple companies, one that, that made an announcement at HIMSS that I was kind of excited about, I'm blanking on the name of it, but companies that are taking beyond, going beyond just unstructured messaging. So I was a, I was a Kaiser member for a few years, um, and I used their um, patient portal. I guess it was Epics that, that um, Kaiser had rebranded their health manager uh, to um, – message my physician. It was just an email. You know, there'd be who I'm sending it to, a subject, and then a blob of text, right? But I think what we're starting to see, which is kind of exciting, is the ability to actually start structuring the information that comes in. So if somebody is having 
uh, an acute sort of incident and something that, you know, isn't life-threatening, obviously, they can fill out some basic information and maybe get directed either to, maybe maybe they get directed and say, you have to come in for this, or you should come in for this, um, or it's something that says, okay, it sounds like you have this, we'll have our physician review it and get back to you, and then they can review it. But that data coming in, you can actually, once it's structured, you can start layering in some logic um, in terms of the actual questionnaire so that you can kind of create brands branch points for the person, but then additionally, once it's structured, you can start um, providing some decision support as that as the answers come into the physician to give them sort of pull in some evidence-based uh, um, references and decision support tools to give them some guidance in terms of what type of care to provide based on the answers the person's given. Um, I think that uh, so that that's that's structured messaging, or almost you can almost think of it like virtual visits. And then next is just providing patients access to their data and portability of the portability of their data, so that whether it's blue button or CCD or whatever it is coming out of the practice and or direct pay, direct um, primary care practice, uh, you know, flows into a PHR. And then I think providing the ability for the person from there from their PHR to to you know either archive that themselves on their you know Dropbox account or their local computer. Or potentially, you know, put it into a different PHR. You know, Microsoft Health Vault is the, the, the big winner in that space. But there's a lot of other people, but just giving them the portability. And then, you know, there's USB drives. Excuse me. There's USB drives. There's in case of emergency apps. There's all these things, and just providing them some portability for that data. Um, you know, with the virtual visit, I think that that, that we're seeing, or what we will see, is more one-to-one. You know, Skype, FaceTime. Um, virtual visits where they're actually like not asynchronous where it's filling out a form and getting, you know, a response from a physician would be an asynchronous um, virtual visit, but things are actually synchronous where the physician, you know, has a time slot of 10 minutes and they sit down in front of the computer or their iPad or their, 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 their smartphone um, and they're able to do a video call or video conference with somebody. Um, so those are the types of apps and services I see. I think there's a lot more beyond that. I think that, you know, I, I think that, Sort of, that's the most immediate. I think going beyond that, you'll start to see, or hopefully, we'll start to see integration of some of the things I was mentioning before, some of the sensor technologies, the Fitbits, or, or, or fitness apps like RunKeeper, um, scales like the ones from Withings, or, or blood pressure cups, connected glucometers, all those things sort of flowing in, and physicians being able to see that, not just a huge log of readings, which is almost I mean, it doesn't really add much, uh, but actually, you know, some sort of summary data, something to show the physician and, and the patient where they can work collaboratively to understand why your weight, you know, might be trending this way this time of year, your glucose readings might trend this way this time of day, um, providing actually um, uh, some logic on top of that data and, and, and starting to pull in more patient reporting data I see is the next stage. I don't see that as immediate, but I, I think that once we start integrating some of that data and we start making some of that data accessible and interoperable, which is a big thing, I think we'll start seeing that actually get integrated into physicians' workflows and, and integrated into the doctor-patient relationship. And I think probably the first place that will happen is in the concierge direct primary care space. Absolutely. And I think another big component of uh, the communications um in that area will be the content that the doctors are creating and curating themselves to provide meaningful um, uh, communications about d- different diseases or procedures or trends or maybe even some of these data patterns that they're, uh, you know, looking at the summaries and, and putting that out there through social media, through blogs, um, through, you know, a, a more of a, a global mind on, on, on some of these patterns of, of what's happening. I, I agree completely, and I have um, I have a few uh, physician friends that, that have just you know starting out in practice over the last few years have, have been sort of testing the waters and, and trying to do things with you know Twitter and social media and, and getting out there you know as they read evidence, sort of providing a hundred and you know forty character snippet uh, to boil that down for what that actually means for their diabetic patients, right? And I think that's a great, great great start. And then, you know, obviously I think ideally we'll start to see, you know, diabetics and patients following their physicians and, and physicians may have to have multiple accounts, but uh, most of physicians I know they do. Um, but, you know, if, if their their patients can follow their professional Twitter accounts and sort of on an ongoing basis get the advice uh, that they're putting out, I think that's really, really exciting stuff. And then you open up just sort of this public dialogue, other physicians can weigh in, um, patients can ask questions. It becomes um, pretty exciting stuff. Um, there are obviously... 
you know, and everybody's going to, or there's a lot of people that, that are concerned about security and privacy, and I, I, I definitely respect all of that. Um, but if it's patient-driven and the patients want it there and the patients are willing to go there, then that's great, and I don't think it necessarily has to be something that, that you know, those networks, they don't have to be things where PHI or anything like that is listed, uh, but we can actually create real meaningful and valuable discussions um, connecting and, and, you know, patients to their providers, patients to other providers, providers to providers, so. And those um, might be some of the types of apps that Catalyze that I will be working on. Uh, yes, I we are. Yes, <laughs> I'll say that we are working on things um, in the concierge space and, and tools to connect um, physicians to providers. And, and in the next few months, we'll start launching some of those. And we're we're really really excited about them. Um, and we're developing them with. Uh, what we're trying to do is develop them with providers and with patients and not just in a vacuum, but actually delivering tools that, that people need today that they can that they can leverage today to, to um, improve care and access and all those things. So we're, we're, we're very in the space, we're very excited to be, and I think that, you know, it, it I mean, well, the, you know, I'm, I'm telling you my thoughts on the trends in the industry, but at least where I see the industry going, so. Well, I think that's very exciting. We'll have to check back in with you in a couple of months. <laughs> uh, definitely. Yes, definitely, definitely. We have a lot going on. It's, it's, it's a very exciting time. It's a very exciting time in healthcare. Healthcare is a great industry. It's incredibly huge and fragmented and frustrating at times, but um, those challenges are also really just incredibly massive opportunities. So, um, you know, and I'm not talking about from a financial perspective. I'm talking about just from an impact perspective. And a, right. You know, I mean, so it's a, it's a great place to be. And everybody is a patient at some point, so. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful to hear all your ideas in person. I mean, virtually. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we're in person. This is this is the this is in person two point right. uh, No, it was. I, I really appreciate you having me. It was it was it was fun to talk to you.